In our homes, in our churches, wherever two or three are gathered, there is a discussion of what is best to do. Must we remain in the South or go elsewhere? Where can we go to feel that security which other people feel? Is it best to go in great numbers or only in several families? These and many other things are discussed over and over. A Colored Woman in Alabama, 1902 The Great Migration, 1915-1970 to They fled as if under a spell or a high fever. They left as though they were fleeing some curse, wrote the scholar Emmett J. Scott. They were willing to make almost any sacrifice to obtain a railroad ticket, and they left with the intention of staying. From the early years of the 20th century to well past its middle age, nearly every black family in the American South, which meant nearly every black family in America, had a decision to make. There were sharecroppers losing at settlement, typists wanting to work in an office, yard boys scared that a single gesture near the planter's wife could leave them hanging from an oak tree. They were all stuck in a caste system as hard and unyielding as the red Georgia clay, and they each had a decision before them. In this, they were not unlike anyone who ever longed to cross the Atlantic or the Rio Grande. It was during the First World War that a silent pilgrimage took its first steps within the borders of this country. The fever rose without warning or notice, or much in the way of understanding by those outside its reach. It would not end until the 1970s and would set into motion changes in the North and South that no one, not even the people doing the leaving, could have imagined at the start of it or dreamed would take nearly a lifetime to play out. Historians would come to call it the Great Migration. It would become, perhaps, the biggest underreported story of the 20th century. It was vast. It was leaderless. It crept along so many thousands of currents over so long a stretch of time as to be difficult for the press truly to capture while it was underway. Over the course of six decades, some six million black Southerners left the land of their forefathers and fanned out across the country for an uncertain existence in nearly every other corner of America. The Great Migration would become a turning point in history— it would transform urban America and recast the social and political order of every city it touched. It would force the South to search its soul and finally to lay aside a feudal caste system. It grew out of the unmet promises made after the Civil War and through the sheer weight of it helped push the country toward the civil rights revolutions of the 1960s. During this time, a good portion of all black Americans alive picked up and left the tobacco farms of Virginia, the rice plantations of South Carolina, cotton fields in East Texas and Mississippi, and the villages and backwoods of the remaining southern states, Alabama, Arkansas, Florida, Georgia, Kentucky, Louisiana, North Carolina, Tennessee, and by some measures, Oklahoma. They set out for cities they had whispered of among themselves, or had seen in a mail-order catalog. Some came straight from the field, with their King James Bibles and old twelve-string guitars. Still more were townspeople looking to be their fuller selves, tradesmen following their customers, pastors trailing their flocks. They would cross into alien lands with fast, new ways of speaking and carrying oneself, and with hard-to-figure rules and laws. The New World held out higher wages but staggering rents that the people had to calculate like a foreign currency. The places they went were big, frightening, and already crowded. New York, Detroit, Chicago, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, and smaller, equally foreign cities. Syracuse, Oakland, Milwaukee, Newark, Gary. Each turned into a receiving station and port of refuge, wrote the poet Carl Sandburg, then a Chicago newspaper reporter documenting the unfolding migration there. The people did not cross the turnstiles of customs at Ellis Island, they were already citizens. But where they came from, they were not treated as such. Their every step was controlled by the meticulous laws of Jim Crow, a 19th-century minstrel figure, 
that would become shorthand for the violently enforced codes of the Southern caste system. The Jim Crow regime persisted from the 1880s to the 1960s, some 80 years, the average lifespan of a fairly healthy man. It afflicted the lives of at least four generations and would not die without bloodshed, as the people who left the South foresaw.